Welcome back to the Retro Horror Academy. My name is Daniel Richardson, and today we're going to be looking at the year in horror, 1933. Guys, horror is still riding high right now. Universal's cranking them out. All the other studios are getting in on it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have ten like we did on the last episode, but we got nine, which is pretty fucking solid right now. I'm loving it. I'm loving all these different films we can rank, so... Uh, so let's just get into it. You guys know how we do this. Uh, we rank them. Uh, the top three get different awards: the Bronze Skull, Silver Skull, and the Golden Skull. Uh, yeah, but we're gonna start things off though. We're gonna have a new inductee. Sorry, induction. An inductee into the Horror Hall of Fame. And so we are proud to present the newest uh, inductee into the Horror Hall of Fame, Fritz Lang. Uh, Austrian uh, writer, director, producer, all-around fucking awesome filmmaker. Uh, I think he's going to be known more for non-horror films, obviously, with his films uh, Metropolis and M. And uh, yeah, but up to this point, we've already covered a couple of his films, uh, The Plague of Florence and Destiny, uh, which I particularly like Destiny. Uh, yes, an influential filmmaker who just, you know, Knocked it out of the park. He's great. Uh, yeah, and he definitely deserves his spot in the, uh, you know, in the hallowed halls of the uh, Hall of Fame. So, the Horror Hall of Fame or otherwise, but especially in the Horror Hall of Fame, like I said, uh, his contributions are great. So, uh, Fritz Lang, welcome to the hallowed halls, and uh, yeah, congratulations. So we got, like, like I said, we got nine movies. So let's just get into them. Nineteen thirty-three, number nine. We have La La Lorna. Uh, basically, you know the plot of this one, or you should. It's based on the old Mexican uh, folklore of the crying woman. And uh, basically what happens is the uh, crying woman uh, already strikes once, you know, uh, killing a person in the very beginning. And then what happens is uh, there's a mysterious masked person who is attacking um this family trying to uh, go after their child and sacrifice them. And uh, you find out that, you know, throughout the history, you know, there's a couple of flashback sequences where basically you see, um, you know, this one woman who was, uh, you know, had a child out of wedlock. And this is like back in like the Spanish Inquisition time. Uh, sorry, I don't know my uh, history that well. Uh, if it's not horror related, I just don't know. It. But anyways, uh, but when, you know, she was kind of done wrong there and she ends up killing herself and her baby. And then like she, her spirit starts wreaking havoc. But then it happens again uh, more during when, like, you know, the Spanish are already over here in Mexico. I guess now they're, they're full-on Mexicans. Uh, and there's a uh, Native American girl who um, also loses a child, and she's just so upset that she is trying to, you know, kidnap kids around there. And uh, she uh, also, you know, dies, and her spirit goes on, you know, wailing and crying and everything else. And connecting all of these, it's a ring and a knife. Um, so, yes, this is the very first uh, Mexican horror film that had sound. And uh, when I was doing my research here, it turns out, like, this film, you know, uh, it actually came out the same year that a lot of other films came out with sound. So this is a big year uh, for Mexican cinema in general, horror or otherwise. And, uh, yeah, uh, this is, and it's kind of odd because it's funny because, I don't know, America didn't really do this as much. Like, when movies came out, you know, critics either just panned it or loved it or whatever. But here, it's like the whole nation kind of stood behind this film. Like, a lot of national pride uh, with La La Norna, and it, they, you know, it taken very seriously. Uh, and it was a huge success down in Mexico. Uh, you know, it would go on to spawn multiple remakes, uh, even up till, you know, just very recently. Um, this movie has a 5.8 on IMDb. Uh, for me personally, I watched it. You know, it's not bad. Uh, there are certain, um, I don't know, the flashback scenes aren't too bad, but I, a lot of it was just kind of boring. Like, and the flashbacks were just so odd because, I mean, I guess initially I didn't know what was going on, so that's kind of on me, I guess. Uh, in the end, you know, when you find out that, you know, that ring and the dagger were kind of used in, you know, these two separate incidents, you know, it does kind of make sense that maybe these items are kind of cursed or whatever. Uh, but I don't know. Like I said, it's not bad, but it it does kind of slog through, especially early on. But I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, but yeah, La La Lorna, 
number nine. At number eight, we have the monkey's paw, a uh, mother who recently lost her son, uses the monkey paw to, uh, you know, bring her kid back from the dead. Uh, this is based on the famous story, and this is another one that, you know, would be remade several times as uh, time would go on. Uh, this film was actually considered lost for the longest time uh, until uh, about 2006, I believe, and they found a, a copy over in France. Of course, the whole thing has been dubbed over with, uh, you know, in French, so you have to, you know, read the subtitles or whatever. Uh, you know, this when this came out, the reviews were, you know, it was good reviews, but a lot of people were just like, this was very dark, and, uh, you know, despite its happy ending or whatever. Uh, it does have a 7.0 on IMDb, and, uh, yeah, you know, it's all right. Again, yeah, is what it is, uh, but, yeah, number eight. It's number eight. Uh, I would honestly probably drop that to nine if it was me personally, but that's just me. That's just me. Uh, I'm on behalf of the entire uh, horror retro horror academy. So, sorry, take a drink. All right, at number seven, Supernatural. Uh, this woman, uh, she's a serial killer. Uh, she's already killed three men at this point, and uh, as she's kind of put to death, her spirit possesses uh, this other girl to take revenge on her uh, ex-lover slash uh, he's a phony psychic that kind of set her up in the first place and she's going to get revenge on him. Um, kind of building up this thing, you know, it was, uh, I'm probably going to butcher his name, Halperin's? The Halpern Brothers, uh, Victor's the director. I don't know who the other Halpern was, I guess the producer. Uh, but this is their follow-up to White Zombie, which came out the previous year. And, of course, that was a big success. And the fact that it was an independent film, you know, meant that, like, oh, shit. The studio didn't take their huge cut or whatever. And a lot of this money right there, money to be made. And they decided to go ahead and do uh, another one here. And a lot of the cast and crew did, uh, you know, from uh, White Zombie, uh, would end up working on Supernatural as well. Um... Just some little things here. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll read off. Apparently, the uh, director, uh, Victor Halpern, and um, oh, Caroline, the, Car Carly, Corley, Lombard, uh, the main girl, the main actress. Apparently, they clashed several times. Uh, she was, she, I don't know, she thought she was above horror. But she definitely said that she was more suited for comedy, and so she just never felt right, I guess, in this. But I guess they were constantly clashing over just different stuff. Uh, not just that, but, you know, I guess another big setback was there was a huge earthquake that happened during this time, and it shut production down, too. So this movie didn't quite have uh, the momentum that White Zombie had. Uh, anyways... Uh, you know, this movie, when it came out, uh, it had, you know, middle to good reviews. Uh, it seems like as time has gone on, uh, reviews have been a little bit more kinder to it. Um, this thing also uh, was not as successful as White Zombie. Didn't quite make the money that White Zombie did. Uh, this was a pre-code movie as well, and uh, we're going to be getting close to that code coming up. Uh, so when this thing would finally be released on TV, uh, it was very limited the time you see it, much like... Uh, Island of the Lost Souls, uh, because of the sexual content, which I don't think was that bad, but again, you know, it's the 30s or whatever, 30s to the 60s, so uh, yeah, TV just wasn't going to fly up fast, so you know, they had to make some cuts or whatever, uh, but anyways, yeah, the uh, movie itself, IMDb has it at a, a 6.2, and this has a 50% rating on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, personally, I don't know, this was just okay as well, I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of just okays. Uh, on this top 10 for me personally. Um, it wasn't boring. It just, I don't know. It's like a lot going on. They had a lot of shit kind of happening in this movie at once. You know, at one point it's like, is this going to be, a, it's a movie about a fake psychic who is trying to, you know, scam this other girl and then turns out that, you know, there's a serial killer woman who's coming back from the dead. I don't know. It just seemed like they were trying to cram a lot in here. Um... It was all right. I'll, I'll give it an okay. Again, not not great, but w what really was it around this time? Uh, so, that was number seven, Supernatural. At number six, The Vampire Bat in a small uh, village. I think we were set in England. I'm not sure. Either way, uh, a lot of bodies are winding up uh, with their blood drain, so people are just assuming vampires. Or, I guess, a giant vampire bat. Uh, so, uh, in this movie, uh, Fay Ray and uh, Lionel Atwill play. Uh, Fay Ray is the, the lead actress, and uh, Lionel Atwill, uh, spoiler alert, will be the villain uh, in the end. 
so they were together in Dr. X, and Dr. X did big business. And it turned out, uh, you know, I forget what studios did these. I apologize. I'm going to say Paramount, but I'm not for sure. But um, coming up, and it's on the list as well, uh, this year in 1933, Mysteries uh, of the uh, Wax Museum was also going to be released that also had Faye Ray and Lionel Atwill. So literally you got two films here uh, with Faye Ray and Lionel Atwill that, you know, both, you know, one was already a success and then they're hyping up this other one coming out. So this studio decided, you know what, let's just throw together a little cheapy film and throw Faye Ray and Lionel Atwill together uh, and just hope to capitalize on, you know, them coming up in the Mystery of the Wax Museum. And it worked. Uh, yeah, they threw them together, uh, and this movie actually did make pretty good money. Uh, to give it that universal look. Now, this one was, I guess, less out of trying to give it that look and more just out of necessity, and it was cheap. Uh, they actually used the sets, the laboratory uh, in the, the Vampire Bat was actually from Frankenstein. And then a lot of the house interiors was from the old dark house. So they were using a lot of universal sets. But to also give that universal uh, vibe, they casted Dwight Fry in this movie. Um which, unfortunately, uh, I don't know. The character, it's like Renfield on crack. <laughs> like, it's just, it's amped up big time. Uh, but this movie only, you know, even though it did good back then, uh, it only got 3.7 on IMDb. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, 67% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, yeah, not as well like today or, you know, whatever. Uh, but financially, it did all right. Uh, for me, again, this is this kind of another middle of the road type movie. I was actually looking forward to this one. Uh, there was a handful on here that I was really kind of like, "All oh, right, this is gonna be great." And yeah, I don't know. I guess the hype was kind of built up. Um, you know, I like the fact that you know you're dealing with angry mobs that I like movies, and this don't really go as extra. I guess it kind of does, but you know, uh, I like movies where I don't know the real evil is kind of the people, even though not necessarily in the vampire bat, I guess, but you see what mob mentality does here. And you really do feel bad because again, I'm, I'm dropping some spoilers from here on out, but um, you know, Dwight Fry, he's playing mentally challenged, like a mentally challenged guy, but everybody is now just accusing him of being this vampire, this vampire bat. Like he morphs into a giant bat and he ends up getting chased into a cave and then he ends up taking his own life. He jumps off this cliff because he doesn't want to, you know, Feel the wrath of this mob, and it turns out the dude was innocent the whole time. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of you know that's a little fucked up right there. Um, they don't really go into detail as much, but Lionel Otwell, who like I said, he plays the villain the whole time. He's kind of the doctor. Uh, who, he's an ally, a friend of these people. But he, I guess he, cre I guess he created somebody, and then he has mind control over him. But this guy he created would go on and like become like a chief of police or a detective or something. Like the guy was like helping with the investigation. It's like how did you create someone and then? Get him a good job. I don't know. Anyways, but he uses mind control to uh, work that guy over. And then, uh, yeah, the guy needed uh, human blood, I guess, to, to keep going. Uh, again, it was okay. That's, that's why it's kind of low on the list, I feel. Uh, and for my list, personally, yeah, uh, it, was, it was just okay. We're going to move now to uh, number five. Number five film of uh, 1933, Night of Terror. Um, Got to, you know... Someone died in this family, a rich family, and so all the heirs must uh, come to the house and uh, they're going to have to perform the seance. However, uh, there is a killer that's trying to knock them off one by one. Uh, this has Bell Lugosi in it, and he actually has top billing, even though he's literally more of a supporting actor in this thing uh, than anything else. But that was very common uh, for him and Karloff, and we'll get into that a little bit later too, but uh, these guys were always kind of like top billing because... Come on, it's Dracula and Frankenstein's monster, respectively. So, of course, they're going to get top billing. Uh, it turns out, Bela Lugosi, I guess this is around the time that he was in major debt. And, uh, unfortunately, this is around the time that Universal was kind of lowballing him when it came to money. Uh, anyways, uh, so to kind of make ends meet, he was pulling double duty. He shot a film called International House. I don't know what the fuck that was. Uh, I don't think it was. It clearly wasn't a horror film because it didn't come on the radar when I was looking up the horror films of 1933. But he was shooting that during the day. And then at night, he was shooting Night of Terror. Um, and it's one of those rare, you know, he's, he's, he's the good guy in this thing instead of that guy. Although they do kind of uh, portray him as, you know, he's a red herring. Because, again, he's Dracula, so you think, you know, right off the bat. Uh, although it is, you know, interesting to note that even though he doesn't play the killer per se, 
uh, whenever the maniac is running around the house and attacking and killing people, it was Bela Lugosi in the outfit of the maniac. So, I mean, even though, and I guess that maybe you know, kind of throw you off, you know, you see him, you look close to his eyes, like, oh, shit, that's Bela Lugosi, and then it turns out, nope. Uh, they did that intentionally. They wanted you know to think that you know Bell was in fact the uh, the killer. Uh, this film has a 5.5 on IMDb, uh, so you know kind of the middle of the road thing. And I'll agree with it. It's it, it's better than you know the previous films we talked about. Uh, and in fact, I, you know, I'll say right now, this probably deserves to be where it's at. I'd say, um, yeah, uh, it is kind of cool little twist at the end. You find out you know. This guy who buries himself, which I thought that whole thing was kind of a dumb subplot, but whatever. This guy buries himself. Uh, it turns out he's the one who's kind of wreaking havoc. Uh, up to that point, I kept thinking, like, God damn, like, this guy a lot of loose threads did. But when the reveal is kind of, you know, thrown out there finally, it all kind of comes together. Um, so, yeah, not a terror. Uh, not bad. Uh, you know, I, I definitely say from here on out, these movies do get better. So I would say, you know, definitely give it a, a check if you're a Bell Lugosi fan or just, you know, a fan of old horror films in general. Uh, so, yeah. Number five, Night of Terror. Going on to number four, we have The Ghoul. Uh, so basically, Boris Karloff plays a, a this guy who's real. He's an e- Egyptianologist. Is that, is that what you call those guys? Basically, he studies Egypt. And he's big uh, Egyptian enthusiast, and uh, he comes back from the grave after he dies. And starts uh, killing the people who have disturbed his tomb, if you will. Uh, this is a British film. And in fact, this was Carlos' first British film uh, since leaving uh, to come to the U.S. to make movies. So he, it's like the first film he did in Britain in like 20 years plus, I think, something like that. So, uh, yeah, kind of a coming home party for him. Give me one second. I'm going to take a quick drink. A one-man band, and I don't do editing, so... Suck it. Uh, anyways, uh, this was actually shot uh, during a contract dispute that uh, Karloff was having with Universal. And so it kind of gave him a little bit of window of time to go back and see his family in the UK. And uh, yeah, get a, get a movie out of it as well. Uh, this movie actually did pretty good in the UK, uh, but didn't do so well over here in the US. Uh, so yeah. Um, this film was actually thought to be lost for a while until it was uh, rediscovered uh I think it's like in the 60s or something like that. You know, someone came across this. Uh, it would get remade as a film called uh, What a Carve Up. It was a horror comedy from the UK. I don't know. Uh, anyways, the big thing note here is uh, this was the first British horror film with sound. Uh, up to this point, they've all been silent films. Uh, but also, this was the first br- uh, British horror film to be labeled horrific. And that is the origins of the genre that we would later call horror because they had all these films they didn't know how to label them so you label them as horrific and then it gets shortened down to horror uh within the next year i believe so yeah so kind of got the origin story of horror right there so for that alone you know uh there you go now we mentioned earlier that um with night of terror you know bella lugosi got top billing but he was basically a, a side character here now granted uh, boris karloff uh, he is the he is the title the titular ghoul uh, in this movie uh, he gets top billing as well, but it's just interesting to note that he gets less screen time than the rest of the supporting cast. Like, everyone in this thing is way in it more in, than him. And the dude only has lines in the first scene, and that's it. Because uh, after that, he you know he's a dead walking corpse or whatever. Um, yeah, and then the only other really things I can, I can uh, little notes before I go into my review. Um, in the old dark house, the guy, I forget the guy's name, but the guy who plays uh, Boris Karloff's butler in this movie, uh, in the old dark house, Karloff was his butler. So this is kind of an interesting little side note there. Uh, and then this movie was apparently supposed to get remade in the 60s because uh, this producer, who apparently you know really loved the ghoul, uh, thought it'd be kind of cool that, you know, because in this movie, they definitely put a lot of age makeup on uh, Boris Karloff, making him look older. And so when uh, in the 60s rolled around, you know, Karloff's already an old, older guy now. He's an, he's an old man, so they wanted to redo this movie. Uh, however, it just never got off the ground for whatever reason. Uh, IMDb has this uh, ranked at a uh, 5.8. Uh, so they got it as all right. Uh, I like this a little bit better, uh, actually. Uh, in fact, it's probably my, I bumped up to three uh, if I'm doing this list personally. Um, you know, I, I dug the story. I really liked the idea of this guy coming back and then just going on a murder page trying to find it. The only thing that's kind of weird is like the, the supporting characters. Like, I don't know. It just seems like in all these moves so far, 
they always kind of had these like goofy side characters, uh, some kind of comic relief. And this one was just weird because the girl was just like trying to like fuck the guy she thought was like an Egyptian prince or something like that. And I don't know. It just seemed kind of odd. Uh, so tonally, this thing was just kind of all over the place. But uh, no, I thought uh, Karloff looked great as the uh, zombie here. And uh, I like the fact that it actually was him as a zombie or as, you know, something supernatural here. Because up to this point, usually whenever a bad guy's revealed, you know, to be a ghost or whatever, it's just, you know, they do the Scooby-Doo ending. Like, oh, no, it wasn't a ghost at all. It was this guy. No, this is the one time where it's like, no, this motherfucker was a zombie. Like, this dude crawled out of the grave. Fucking yes. So, uh, yeah. And just magic, too. It wasn't like science, like with Frankenstein, you know, where they, you know, stitched him together, brought him back through electricity. No, no, no. This dude came back as, as like, you know, Egyptian magic. Boom. And now he's going to wreak havoc on people he thinks stole uh, his ring or whatever to pass over to the, or become immortal. That's his whole goal in this movie is to become immortal. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I really like the ghoul. Uh, solid, solid thumbs up on that one. So now we're getting to the top three, guys. So you know we start handing out the awards right now. It's time for the Bronze Skull Award. And it's going to go to our number three film, Murders in the Zoo. Uh, basically, this guy, who he's the uh, zoologist at this zoo. And uh, he's insanely jealous of his girlfriend, I mean, or his wife. But, uh, of course, uh, she's kind of cheating on him. So I guess you know he has a right to. But the uh, dude's a psychopath, so he's, he's going to fucking start killing people. Everybody, like anybody gets in this path. Uh, this is probably my favorite movie of, uh, it, and, uh, fuck that, it is my favorite movie of 1933. Uh, and this would almost be one of my favorite films that we've covered so far. Like, whew, I'd put this up there, fan the opera. I know it's a bold statement, but I really dug uh, Murders in the Zoo. Um, you know, when it came out, this movie was considered very fucking dark. Like, uh, a lot of critics said the same thing. Like, this movie is just really bleak and dark and kind of twisted for its time. Uh, the studio made this after success of uh, the land of, uh, or the island of uh, Lost Souls. And so they decided, you know what, let's keep this horror train rolling and let's do murders in the zoo. Uh, so much so that they actually got to cast uh, Catherine Burke. Ka or, yeah, sorry, Kathleen Burke, uh, who was a Panther Woman in the last film in here. Uh, but again, this was a uh, pre- uh, code movie, so once the code kind of got invoked, uh, even before the code got invoked, actually, this movie was being censored, even in the U.S. They'd go to certain uh, states, and they would cut out scenes. Uh, in fact, the script had stuff cut out of it, where um, I, there's a line where, you know, someone says, like, good God, or something like that, and you know, you can't take the Lord's name, and even slight vein like that, uh, and then uh, when he kills his wife, sorry, spoiler alert, um, you know, it goes on a little more. Like, she's trying to hang on to the bridge before she gets dropped into the uh, alligator uh, pond. And, like, he kicks her hand off. And they're like, nope, can't, can't show that. That's that's going too far. Uh, but when this thing went out of uh, the country, it got cut. Like, even, you know, with those two scenes, like, not even put into the film. The rest of the movie got kind of cut down quite a bit. Or was outright banned uh, in certain countries. Uh, the big thing with the reviews, because the reviews here, uh, at least when the uh, movie came out, was kind of middle of the road, you know, yeah, but uh, everybody kind of agreed that, you know, it's just really dark, too real almost. Like, you know, they felt like you go to a horror film, it's fantasy, it's, you know, whatever, but it's fun, it's an escape. And this one was like one of those few movies that's like, God damn, like this is like, there's nothing supernatural or goofy about that. Like this is a straight up murder. Uh, it's a serial killer, you know. Uh, however, in recent times, uh, this movie got a lot of, you know, really good reviews and it's very, you know, it's looked, at, or looked back now as a classic. Um Particularly uh, Lionel Atwell's um, huge year for Lionel Atwell, I guess. Huh? But uh, anyways, uh, yeah, his performance here uh, praised big time, especially now. Uh, this movie has a currently has a 6.5 on IMDb and has a 71% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, yeah, I absolutely love this movie. I thought the story was great and brutal. Uh, first fucking scene, he's sewing a dude's mouth shut and leaving him tied up in the jungle to be killed by tigers. It's like, what the fuck? Uh... You know, as the movie goes on, like, he's killing him. You know, he finally figures out, like, you know, because the reason he kills that first guy is because that guy just came on to his wife. Like, the wife wasn't cheating on him with this guy, and so he fucks him up. But then when she does cheat on him with this other dude, he kills him in a brilliant way. Like, he releases a snake in the uh, zoo, and, of course, he has a similar snake, uh, a, a, just the head of it. Like, he has, like, a snake head on a stick, but it has all the venom still in it, and that's what he's doing, he's fucking puncturing motherfuckers, I think it's brilliant, by the way, uh, and then, yeah, he's just, anybody who's starting to get on his uh, trail, he's killing them, uh, including his wife, who he ends up, like, 
Ether Ragnar, I think, and then like, or he just maybe he just like closes her mouth. I don't know. He like suffocates her somehow, and then just dumps her ass in the uh, pond, and she gets eaten by alligators. What? The, I was just like, son of a bitch. This movie's going hard, uh, and that's why you know again the the the, the haze coat's coming up, and they're gonna really water down shit. But this movie went for it, and I fucking love it for that. Uh, yeah, uh, this movie, yeah, all the thumbs up. Yeah, I'll go on record right now. I, as much as I love Fan of the Opera, and I do love Fan of the Opera, and we've had some really good movies here on, uh, you know, the Retro Horror Academy that I have uh, covered and reviewed. Uh, I gotta say, I think uh, Murders in the Zoo is probably my favorite movie so far. Yeah, it goes above Dracula, Frankenstein, uh, The Mummy. It, yeah, it, it's kicking them all. Because this, this movie had balls. This movie had fucking balls. Uh, so, yeah, number three, the Bronze Skull Award goes to uh, Murders in the Zoo. And that now brings us to our number two film of 1933 and the recipient of the uh, Silver Skull Award. Let Papa get a drink. I'm talking about Mystery of the Wax Museum. So basically there is a string of disappearances and murders and um, all, you know, this reporter basically uh, traces it all back to this one wax museum in the uh, curious curator there. Um... So this is, you know, this is another one of those films that uh, was considered to be, or the original print, because uh, this was actually shot in a two-color Technicolor, uh, same as Dr. X, and there's a, a handful of other films, but I guess, you know, it was just more costly, and it wasn't really making a difference on the bottom line. Black and white movies were still doing really good, and at this, it's kind of funny, because at this point, uh, some of the uh, industry insiders were like, well, you know what, this color fad isn't going to last, and they all went back to black and white. And it would predominantly be black and white, with the exception of, I guess, like, Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. I'm sure there's probably a couple others I'm missing, but we wouldn't really get color movies again until, like, the 50s. So it's like, yeah, black and white kind of dominated. It's kind of interesting that they were just like, ah, it ain't going to last. Like, that, yeah, it's, it's just funny to me. But anyways, so, um, yeah, this is one of the last films to be kind of shot with that technique. Uh, and like I said, this was a uh, follow-up to Dr. X. Not, uh, sorry, not... Like a film, the studio uh, followed it up with Doctor X. I keep saying follow up to a lot of these movies, and it seems like it's a sequel. It's, it's not. None of these are sequels. These are just you know the studio are following this up. So Doctor X did really well. So they're like, you know what, we're going to do it again with the same cast and there, and literally like the same director, same cast. Everybody came over to this. And as I mentioned earlier, when I talked about, um, oh shit, I'm blanking on the name already. Uh, when I was talking about, uh, oh, the Vampire Bat. That's what it was. I had to look at my notes. I had to cheat there for a second. I'm talking about the vampire bat. Uh, Fay Ray and uh, Lionel Atwill, uh, you know, they were headlining this one. And again, they, you know, they already had the, uh, you know, reputation of Dr. X. And then, like I said, uh, Vampire Bat actually came out before uh, Mystery of the Wax Museum. So, boom, again, it's like a winning tag team right there. Uh, so, this thing, it's funny, though. Uh, and I, I should mention, too, that uh, uh, this the story. You know, again, people disappearing, and then they wind up in the wax museum. Uh, one of the characters, who, or one of the uh, victims in this, was uh, this judge in uh, you know New York or wherever the hell this is supposed to be at. I think it's New York, yeah. It originally takes, yeah, yeah, it's in New York because initially London, and they all come to New York. So the judge disappears, and he winds up in this wax museum. Well, this was kind of based loosely on a real uh, life thing. So I guess back in the '30s, there's a Supreme Court justice uh, in the U.S who just vanished. And to this day, like no one ever found him or anything. And I guess it was huge news, so it was very topical. So that's where they were kind of coming at with that. So that was definitely a, a reference to that whole thing. Uh, and then another kind of interesting thing when they were talking about, um, oh, uh, making this movie, that, you know, a lot of the uh, wax figures were actually real people. And, of course, you know, a lot of it's like, well, of course they are, because, you know, it's meant to be real people, you know, real bodies that, you know, are covered in wax or whatever. Uh, but that was not the case, like, why they did it. The reason they did that was because, I guess, they tried to use actual wax figures, but because of the lights they had to use, these special lights for the uh, two-color Technicolor uh, filming uh, process, uh, too hot. So the wax figures would be melting on set, so they actually had to put real people and just have them stand really still. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of the sets here look very similar to Dr. X because it was the same sets. They were just trying to you know save some money here. Uh, so the movie comes out, and uh, it 
opens to mediocre reviews. Uh, you know, not the big follow up they was hoping for with Doctor X, or even the money generated by you know the Vampire Bad. This one just doesn't quite move the needle as much. Uh, however, it you know it does kind of you know cement a legacy. This thing will be remade two more times as a House of Wax, once in the fifties with Vincent Price, and then again in the uh, mid two thousands with Paris Hilton. Uh, so there you go. There's that. Um, this movie has or has a 6.8 on IMDb, and it has a 92% um, Rotten Tomato score. So for whatever mediocre reviews it had, I guess some uh, contemporary guys now are raising that review up. And this thing, uh, the only box office number I have from any of these movies, this movie made 1.1 million dollars, which. In 1933, I'm sure it was ballin'. Um, I enjoyed this movie. Uh, not as good as Murders in the in the Zoo. And I actually had high hopes for this one. I really thought this was going to be, like, a biggie. I guess because you know, I didn't like House of Wax, the, the remake. I never did see the uh, 57 version yet, which I guess I'll, I'll use this as a platform to watch that uh, when we get to the 50s. But, um, no, uh, I, I just thought this was going to be, like, you know, really, you know, solid fucking movie. And it, it, it's all right. It's just, I don't know. Not as good as I was hoping. Uh, yeah, and then it's a funny thing with uh, Fay Ray as this detective, or sorry, this uh, reporter trying to, you know, bust this case. The thing that really stuck out to me is this odd in this movie was the whole time her boss is kind of getting a hard time. And I guess they have, like, this friendly whatever thing, but, like, there's a millionaire that she kind of hooks up with, and the guy seems like an actual good dude. And it looks like you know, he's there, he's helping her out the whole time, like they should be falling for each other. And then at the end, she just like chooses the boss over him. And I was like, why? Why are you doing it? I don't know. It was just little things like that that kind of nitpicked on this one. Uh, yeah, it, actually, it was okay. Not 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 nearly as good as Murders in the Zoo. Uh, but yeah, it was all right. Actually, it's not as good as Dr. X here. I think I agree with most of the critics. Dr. X was a better film. But either way, it's our, our number two film, and it is the winner of the Silver Skull Award. So you got to respect it. Uh, another drink. Alrighty. So it's now time for the number one film of, ni- or sorry, number one horror film of 1933, and the winner of the Golden Skull Award. And I don't think anybody's going to be shocked with this one. I am talking about The Invisible Man, a story about a guy, a scientist, who discovers a way to turn himself invisible. However, it drives him insane, and he goes on a murderous rampage. Uh, This is based on the H.G. Wells novel, and, uh, of course, with the Island of Lost Souls doing so well, they decided to buy this up, too. The weird thing was they also uh, bought up another book called The Murderer Invisible, and lesser known. Because probably has a weird, awkward, fucking clunky title. But uh, they were they were writing a lot of scripts. And they kept trying to use more of the murder invisible elements. I guess it's just more gruesome and bloody and violent or whatever. And so they were kind of using the Invisible Man in H.G. Wells' name. But trying to use the murder invisible storyline. If that makes sense to you guys. And so we'll get back to that in a second. So... When Dracula comes up, comes out, it's a huge success. You know, Universal is going to strike quickly. And so this was initially going to be the follow-up. But someone in the higher up decided, no, let's go with Frankenstein instead, which, you know, probably worked out for the best. Um, so this was going to be after that. And initially, James Wells was attached to direct. And uh, Boris Karloff was going to be the Invisible Man. And uh, this thing would go in and out of production so much. Uh, reading it was ridiculous, but they kept hiring new writers, and again, I guess H.G. Wells had to have, like, final, uh, approval of the script, and he just didn't like any of the scripts, so every time they get going, they, you know, they halt, so James Wells dropped out, and he didn't want to be known as, like, the horror guy, so he went off to do a couple other movies, but I guess each movie he did just didn't do as well, uh, so he'll eventually come back to being the, the horror guy, uh, which I hate when people do that shit, I don't want to be known for horror, but go fuck yourself, all right? Be like Boris Karloff. He embraced being a horror icon. Uh, anyways, uh, Boris Karloff did this kind of same thing. Every time it, you know this movie would drop and James Well would walk away, they'd bring in new writers, they'd bring in a new director, and then James Well, or sorry, uh, Boris Karloff, he would leave and do another project and then come back. Uh, and as we already mentioned, you know, before he you know, did the old Dark House from uh, 32, he would do uh, the ghoul here during this contract dispute and everything. Uh, so, anyways, this would happen, you know, off and on quite a bit. And eventually, James Wells would come back, and he was 
on and off the movie like two or three times, like no joke, uh, as was Karloff. Now, originally, I guess the, re- the report for years has been that Karloff left because of a pay disagreement or something like that, but that was not the case. I guess him and James Wells just got into it a lot, and I guess James Wells decided, you know, or Karloff decided, you know what, enough, I'm out, and he leaves for good. Uh, James Wells won the uh, hire Claude Rains, and uh, at that time, Claude Rains was, you know, very unknown. He was a stage actor. I think he only did like one actual feature film, but it's like from the silent era from like the early 20s or something. So he wasn't established in Hollywood, and the producers did not want to use him. However, they was wanting to push Colin Clive, also from Frankenstein, on him. And of course, he, uh, you know, he, he, he agrees to pitch it to him, but I guess when he pitched it to Colin Clive, he just straight up asked him, please don't accept it. Because if you accept it, then I can't hire, you know, Claude Rains, and that's who I want to hire. And with Colin, you know, Clyde being his good friend, he's like, yeah, no problem. And he, he backed out. And so Claude Rains was eventually hired. And I guess, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Um, yeah, while the, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I got sidetracked there. So he gets hired on there. Uh, the lead actress, uh, Gloria, or Gloria Stewart, I guess they clashed a lot on the set. Because uh, I guess, again, Claude Rains is like this hardcore stage actor, and, you know, he's just basically upstaging Gloria Stewart the entire time. Like, wouldn't, you know, he kept kind of like, you know, moving in on her and wouldn't let her, you know, pretty much bullying her, I guess, on camera. And like, even James Will would, like, you know, step in, like, dude, you, you, you got to give her something to work with here. You just can't, you know, chew all the scenery. But he did anyways, and so Gloria Stewart, uh, I don't know, she'd go on to kind of trash Universal in general, and I'm like, that just sounds like sour grapes. But uh, I, maybe she has a, a, a good argument here. Who knows? Uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, interesting side note with the score, uh, the score was written for this movie, would be reused uh, to save money later down the road in uh, a couple films, uh, Werewolf of London and The Black Cat, and would also be used in the sci-fi serials uh, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. So kind of interesting little note there. And then, of course, I think the one thing that we got to talk about, obviously, is the special effects. Incredible. Uh, and they still hold up today, I think. Like, seriously, I watch it. I'm like, this looks really good right here. Uh, and a lot of the budget went to these special effects. In fact, they had to shoot uh, two different things. Kind of, you know, I guess, now how we do it. We'll shoot, you know, the movie and then post effects later on. And they kind of had to do the same thing, you know, at this time, too. So it's kind of neat to see that, you know, the same kind of techniques or whatever was kind of used. Um, oh, and I also should mention, too, there's a couple of... Uh, uh, Actors in here that were winning uncredited. Dwight Fry, uh, he shows up uh, in this film. And then so does uh, John Carradine. So, yeah, got a couple of uh, horror heavyweights in there, uh, you know, uncredited in this film. Uh, this movie comes out, it is gangbusters. Does great money, great reviews. Uh, it becomes a major influence for filmmakers like Joe Dante and uh, John Carpenter, to name a couple. Uh, literally, they, you know, they all cite, you know, this film is like, you know, one of their favorites or whatever, and was a big influence on, you know, just their work in general. Uh, this thing, you know, the legacy of this thing, I mean, it's, you know, spawned multiple sequels, lots of rip-offs, uh, remakes, I mean, you fucking name it. Uh, the only thing I thought was kind of odd was, uh, of all the big universal movies that would get remade by Hammer, uh, this and, uh, along with, uh, Creature from Black Lagoon, were two that were never touched, and I don't know why. I feel like The Invisible Man, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of the great ones, I don't know. Uh, but anyways, this thing has a 7.6 on IMDb and a 94 fucking percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, I really love this movie. I thought it was really good. Uh, surprisingly good. I don't know. I was never into The Invisible Man. Um, younger, I was a kid. I just didn't think it was... I mean, I didn't know anything about it. I just literally knew... I saw you know clips here and there or whatever. I knew the gist of it, but I was just like, I don't know. I just don't see how he's going to rank up there with Dracula and Frankenstein and all of them. And, uh, yeah, uh, when I went back and watched this, I was, or when I saw this, I was like, oh, my God, like this is really good. I love Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon uh, from 2000, 2001, something like that. I uh, loved it. But, uh, yeah, never would have thought this would be as good as it was. And I actually really loved it. I, loved, I thought the special effects were good. I thought Claude Rains did great. Uh, just a great story all around. So, uh, yeah, so there you guys have it. That is a... Uh, uh, that's 1933 in the world of horror. I glossed over one thing. I'm sorry. I should have wrote the note down. I didn't, but this kind of hit me. Um, as I was mentioning how Claude Rains did great and how the Invisible Man uh, surprised me. Uh, I want to go back for a split second. This is a little side editor note here. Uh, I want to talk about how underappreciated, I believe, uh, Lionel Atwill uh, w- was. Uh, after watching him as the villain in uh, Murders in the Zoo, like I, I feel like he should 
be ranked up there. And I know he didn't have like that iconic character, and that's probably why he's never mentioned in the same breath as like, you know, Bell Lugosi or, you know, Boris Karloff or what or Juan Chaney or Chaney Jr. Uh, and I get it. You know, he's kind of on that second tier uh, with like Glenn Strange and, you know, whatever. Uh, Colin Clive, I guess. But it's just like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I think he is, he was fucking, he was awesome. And murders in the zoo, uh, and he's he was good in everything else. I mean, he was good in you know mysteries, wax museum. He was good in uh, you know the vampire bat, whatever. Uh, the other films we you know we've talked about, he's been in so far. But like he nails it there. And I don't know. I just feel like he's definitely underappreciated. Like when his time comes, get inducted into that horror hall of fame. It'll be a well deserved you know induction. All right, guys. So just to kind of recap, real quick, in the year of 1933, in the in the world of horror, we've inducted Fritz Lang into the horror hall of fame, and at number nine. La La Norna. At number eight, The Monkey's Paw. Number seven, Supernatural. Number six, The Vampire's Bat, or The Vampire Bat. Uh, number five, Night of Terror. Number four, The Ghoul. At number three, winner of the Bronze Skull Award, Murders in the Zoo. Uh, at number two, uh, winner of the uh, Silver Skull Award, Mystery of the Wax Museum. And at number one, winner of the Golden Skull, the Invisible Man. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we've had Universal dominating like these last three years. Because so 32 was uh, The Mummy, and then number 31 was The uh, Dracula. So yeah, Universal just dominating the uh, horror scene right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because guess what? They are the kings of horror. So that's all I got. Uh, for this episode of the uh, Retro Horror Academy. I want to thank you guys for uh, listening in. Uh, yeah, so that's all we got this week, guys. Uh, tune in next time when we uh, cover 1934. So I've been Danny Richardson, and this has been the Retro Horror Academy, and you're dismissed. <laughs>